the most anticipated RPG of 2024 released last week, and with a slew of bad reviews across Reddit, YouTube, and the Steam store that discuss a plethora of shortcomings both in and out of game, is Dragon's Dogma 2 really worth the $70? Let's dive into the land of the Arisen and explore both the highs and the lows that have left players divided. Dragon's Dogma 2, the highly anticipated sequel from Capcom Games, is a single-player open-world RPG adventure set in both the kingdoms of Vermund and Batal, where mythical creatures and ancient powers reign, and a shadow of darkness is spreading its tendrils once again. Your journey begins as you learn of a mysterious prophecy foretelling of the return of an ancient dragon. As chaos descends upon the land, you, the Arisen, emerge from humble beginnings to embark on an epic quest. Accompanied by AI companions known as pawns, you set out to uncover the truth of your destiny and save the world from impending doom. But how does this open world RPG rank among powerful classics like Skyrim, Elden Ring, and Dark Souls? Let's start with the character creation. Prior to the game's full release on March 22nd, Capcom released the character creator for players to get started with. If you're like me and like building characters from the ground up, be prepared to spend a while in here as you'll want to fully customize your resin and its main pawn. You'll choose a race, either human or beastern, and then be able to get down to the very granular levels of detail for everything from facial features to body proportions. Be careful when creating your character though. In order to change your physical appearance once finalized, you'll have to go to a Barbary in-game and pay a fine amount of gold or purchase the Art of Metamorphosis DLC for $1.99. It should be known that the book does also become available in-game as you progress the storyline without having to pay for it. One of the only drawbacks in character creation lies in the limited choices for hairstyles, tattoos, and accessories. They do have some additional colors that can be accessed in Bakbatal further along in the game for more customization options though. Then, with the inclusion of various vocations and abilities, you'll be able to add depth to character progression and playstyle. Overall, the character creation process ultimately empowers players to bring their visions to life, with an extensive array of customization options. The next step in your character's journey is picking a vocation. When you first load up Dragon's Dogma, you'll be presented with four vocations to choose from. Each vocation possesses unique abilities, strengths, and weaknesses, allowing players to tailor their play style to suit their preferences. The Fighter vocation excels in close quarter combat that allows you to get up close and personal to the mythical beasts of the world. They wield a sword and shield and boast a higher defense to withstand enemy attacks. This is the initial hack and slash class that allows you to cut down foes with ease. Thieves are more agile and tout two daggers that they use to quickly and viciously break through the enemy's guard with ease and vigor. Although they may not deal as much damage as a fighter, their speed and agility allow them to deal a lot more smaller strikes at a faster speed, allowing them to focus on more enemies at once. Archers wield the bow and strike down foes from a distance. Their arrows are quick to find enemy weak points and can often be imbued with poisons and toxins to inhibit the beasts and disable them for periods of time, turning the tides of battle easily. Lastly, mages use their staves to cast a variety of spells. Their command of enchantments and curative magics make them a helpful addition to any party. With the ability to restore health and cast curative spells that cure any debilitation, and more offensive spells like High Flagration and Frigger that allow them to deal massive damage to the enemy, their value is immense. Overall, the vocations pretty much speak for themselves, but I would caution anyone against choosing Major Archer as their primary vocation at the beginning. After playing 40 hours as Mage, it personally took the fun out of combat as the playstyle is more of a secondary support type style. It was fun in other ways, but if you are someone who enjoys the grit and struggle of cutting down an enemy, Archer and Mage can feel a little lackluster in terms of fighting and might be best reserved for your main pawn or hired pawns. Don't worry though, if you're unhappy with your class after you load in, you can always head to the vocation hall in any city to change your vocation free of charge. You'll also unlock four additional vocations that are available only to the Arisen as you progress. Speaking of pawns, the follower or pawn system in Dragon's Dogma 2 is unique compared to other single-player RPGs of its type. In games like Skyrim, Elden Ring, and Dark Souls, you're able to recruit certain NPCs or online players to assist you in battle with little to no customization. Yet in Dragon's Dogma 2, you're able to fully customize your followers or pawns down to their appearance and vocation. When you first start, you're able to customize your main pawn with all the same customization features as your Arisen. As you travel and fight with your pawn, it will level up its vocation and experience alongside you. It is good to start off with a pawn that has a skill set that contrasts and complements your Arisen's vocation. For example, if I start as a mage, I would likely want to have a thief or fighter as my pawn, or vice versa. You will quickly come across random pawns in the world that will come up and ask to be hired. 
You can use RC to hire them on the spot or turn them down and access other ponds via rift stones located throughout the world. These ponds belong to other Arisens and most of the time you will have fun checking out the Arisens it's tied to. You can also set a pond quest for your own to be completed once hired. This is a great way to farm resources from other players in return for gold or other items of use. As you navigate and stop at inns to rest, your pawn will update you on any adventures it's gone on and any gifts or likes or hearts it's received from other Arisens. For me, this is one of the best features in the game. The pawn system really allows you to feel connection with other players. You can even hire your friend's pawns or official pawns that belong to famous content creators. Not only is it a lot of fun to see other people's pawns and creativity, but the fact that they are AI and can adapt to the world, recognize if they've been there with their Arisen before, and then guide you to chests, areas of interest, and quests is so helpful when you have the right pawn. They are so useful in battle if you have higher level pawns or certain skill sets as well. Pawns are such a good way to round out your strategy and ensure your success in the story and battles that await you. Speaking of battles, you'll be utterly shocked with how frequently you come across them. From goblin tribes to knackers to griffins, cyclops, orcs, and dragons, the world of the Arisen is laden with mystical creatures and wildlife alike. If you're out adventuring, small battles will take place pretty regularly, allowing you to collect resources that are useful in enhancing equipment early on or selling for gold. These types of battles can be easy or difficult depending on your party's vocations and strengths. As you level up, you'll start to face bigger foes and bosses that will take much more stamina, magic, and sheer attack power to combat. With higher tier bosses, though, comes higher tier rewards. The game does a really good job at scaling these encounters and leveling structures. As you level your vocation rank from 0 to 9 at max, you will unlock new weapon attacks, core skills, and augments that will help you fight larger foes. The fighting feels very fluid and consistent in the game, and the success of each battle will lie on your ability to form a decent party and strategize using their strengths and weaknesses. You'll have fun mixing and matching vocations and pawns along the way until you find the perfect setup to win each fight. Winning fights can be very fun and leveling up can be very rewarding, but in the end, the main story is really the star of the show. The game's narrative is captivating, filled with intriguing characters and a deep lore that keeps you invested throughout your adventure. The choices you make have consequences, shaping the outcome of the story and adding a layer of depth to the overall experience. I've often struggled with RPGs where the storyline can be completed in just a few days time. It can feel like there isn't a very good replay value once the main story is over. With Dragon's Dogma 2, the length of the story is seemingly perfect. This isn't to say that you couldn't speedrun it if you wanted to, but having sunk entire weekends and after work evenings into the game and still not even being halfway done is a massive W to me. I feel as though right when I finish one task, another is lurking around the corner. When I've conquered a huge piece of the story, I find that something crazier just happened in a neighboring town. The story and the world truly feel alive with time-sensitive quests, quests with multiple outcomes, and pawns having experienced different outcomes with different arisens and living to tell you the tale. It feels fluid and alive in many ways, and each side quest feels like a story of its own. You won't find a lot of give NPC X ingredient for a reward type of quests, but more drawn out and thought out tales of rescue, espionage, and mystery. You can easily get lost in a town due to the amount of side quests you will be tempted with, which I think adds to the length of playtime and hours in the game. And once you do complete the main story, you may want to restart it and play again with another character or pawn, or even just try it out with another vocation. The world of Dragon's Dogma 2 is meticulously crafted with stunning visuals and a sprawling open world to explore. From lush forests to towering mountains, each location feels alive and filled with secrets waiting to be discovered. The attention to detail is evident in every corner, making the journey through this realm a truly immersive and awe-inspiring experience. You'll truly feel like you are right up against the snout of a dragon or bumping around on the back of an ox cart as you are scurried through the dirt pathways between bustling towns. The regality of the noble sector comes to life with sprawling gardens and humbling towers as the slums are riddled with grime and shattered housing structures. Everything in the world comes to life before your eyes and envelops you in the mystery and shroud that plagues the world. It feels fluid and functional to run around and truly take in the beauty of the open world. But KP, what about the crashes and microtransactions? Well, before we rate the game a 10 out of 10, it is important to acknowledge why the game was getting such bad reviews out of the gate and how that may or may not affect the game now. Upon release, there were a ton of crashing issues with Dragon's Dogma 2, and it was making it unplayable for a huge population of the community. It was frustrating, irritating, and ultimately a shame that so many people were not able to have a good first experience with the game right out of the gate. Though few and far between, it really did disrupt my immersion with certain things when there would be freezing and crashing at different points. Although I am used to the crashing in games like Sea of Thieves and other games that I play regularly on Twitch, this should not be the norm of video games today. 
anyone should be able to have access to gaming, and it should not be gatekept by those that have the most up-to-date rig or up-to-date CPU or GPU. Anyone should be able to load up a game and be able to play it. Although this can be frustrating and it should be taken into account in this review, I do not think it impacts the story and the beauty of the game itself. I think it would be doing it a disservice to take away from the beauty of the game and how well made the game is to focus solely on the crashing. At the time of posting this review, I have experienced way less crashes than I have day one, and I'm hoping that will just continuously improve. As far as the microtransactions go, it definitely is disappointing to see them in this game for sure. I think it leaves a bad taste in consumers' mouths and it continues to proliferate microtransactions in gaming overall. It kind of goes along with my last point about anyone being able to game and experience the beauty of it. But with that said, the microtransactions in this game don't impact your progression of the story, your leveling ability, or your skills or weapons in any way. Most of the DLCs are stuff you'll stumble across in game anyway in order to change your appearance, change the music, hire a pawn, get a camping kit, anything like that you will ultimately encounter in game anyway. You're not missing out on anything if you don't purchase these DLCs and at the end of the day I haven't purchased them and I've been completely fine in my progression of the story and my enjoyment of the game and being able to navigate the world and fight dragons and do all of the stuff that this game provides. I do understand fully though that that can look really bad for Capcom and why people are frustrated about it and how it can really leave a lasting impact for a lot of people. Ultimately for me, it doesn't take away from the game. If it does for you, I totally understand and respect that. For me, this is the first game in a while that has really captivated me and taken all of my free time and attention. When I'm not playing it, I wanna be, and I'm thinking about how I can progress the story, what vocation I might wanna explore next, and how I can assemble my pawns to have the best strategy when it comes to battle. The game has ignited a deep sense of curiosity and adventure in me that keeps me hanging on to every quest. The last time I felt this way was in 2012 with the release of Skyrim, and since then I've been looking for a game that has that same touch, that same grasp on me. And this to me is the one. The beauty of the game and its stunning graphics, the exquisitely well-crafted story, and the community-driven interactivity really speak to what a well-made game can really inspire in so many people. If you've written this game off already due to its cold initial reception, I totally understand that, but I sincerely urge you to give it a second chance. I can't fault you if you don't, but at the end of the day, I truly feel as though you'll be missing out on something pretty amazing. Thank you guys for watching along with my review. Please leave a comment down below if you have played the game, if you haven't played the game, why you have, why you haven't, anything in between. I would love to know your thoughts on this game. Um, if your opinions have changed on it since release, any of that stuff would definitely be awesome to hear. Also, if you've liked this review, feel free to give it a thumbs up. That would definitely help me out greatly. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. That would mean the world. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next time.